the establishment of a political capital, a fixed capital, a permanent capital in Japan was kind of a new thing. Of course, it had been tried in Nara. Uh, it had lasted about 70 years there, and then that had been abandoned due to the perceived encroachment, probably, of the Buddhist establishment. Uh, Buddhism being a import from China and Korea, very lasting, obviously important import, but one that had grown too political for the likes of the emperor and some of the great families. And so the capital had been moved from Nara to Nagaoka and finally to Kyoto. Now Kyoto was the site of this shrine. This shrine was actually established a couple centuries before Kyoto was made the permanent political capital. And maybe it's not a coincidence that this is where uh, the emperor decided to establish his new capital. Maybe it's not a coincidence that one of the first things he did was visit this, not Buddhist, but Shinto shrine and become a patron of it when he established Kyoto as the first, and it turned out, a uh, thousand year long, very lasting, permanent political capital in Japanese history in 794. When the ancestors of the imperial house descended from the heavenly plane, they were said to have descended with several uh, items, sacred items. One of those was a sacred mirror. And if you go to Kyoto today, there's a building said to enshrine that mirror. And it's right here. These symbols are very, very important to legitimacy. You know, the fact that you have something tangible that shows you are of the imperial line. The imperial regalia. Okay, this is a sword or the mirror or the jewel. This is important stuff and you see it in other cultures too. Every culture, every, every oligarchic group has its symbols of authority. And it's hard to find a more powerful symbol than that of the imperial regalia of the Japanese imperial line. This is, these are symbols that have been uh, discussed and presented and flaunted for at least 1500 years. Now Buddhism may have been an import from China, the very layout of Kyoto may have been imported from China, based upon Chang'an, the Great Tang Imperial Capital. All of this was from China, so maybe it's kind of strange that within just 45 years of establishing Kyoto as the new permanent political capital, the imperial capital, the last Japanese embassy to China left. A year later it was back and no more were sent. Now, why is that? Now, scholars have puzzled about this a little bit. Um, Maybe it has to do with the fact that the Tang Dynasty was waning, Tang power in China, the Tang state was slowly crumbling. That could have something to do with it. It could also have something to do with the fact that, well, Japanese culture had developed high culture, uh, civilization or high civilization had developed to such a degree that it could stand on its own merits. It didn't need China's approval or new Chinese ideas it had refined itself to a point where it could stand on its own. During the 800s and 900s, Japan finally produced its own writing system, derived from Chinese characters, but based on phonetic symbols. Now, this is a huge difference. There's a huge difference between having to memorize a few phonetic symbols and having to memorize thousands upon thousands, even tens of thousands, of complicated, cumbersome Chinese characters. Okay, so this is gonna open up writing and things of a literary nature to a much wider audience and indeed that was the case during the Kyoto period we have we see an abundance of literature being produced and this is distinctly Japanese literature this is not based on any Chinese prototype these travel diaries these essays uh, these novel length works um, these are Japanese and they're being produced mostly not by the educated men who for various reasons continue to write in cumbersome Chinese characters. It's like a mark of their status or something. They feel it's beneath them, beneath their dignity to write in this, uh, you know, more vernacular language. They use the characters, the Chinese characters. It shows how educated they are. So their uneducated wives and other women of Kyoto and the court, they have the means and they have the, the leisure time to write. So during this period, the vast bulk of literature produced is actually produced by women, including perhaps the, the greatest uh, piece of literature ever created in Japan, the tale of Genji, which was created by a woman during this period. This was a golden age for culture, and it wasn't just literature. 
uh, distinctly Japanese forms in you know architecture, sculpture, painting, and in other fields developed and were demonstrated during this period right here in Kyoto. In fact, Kyoto itself was a cultural magnet. It was the cultural magnet. It almost can't be overstated. The importance, the cultural importance, the cultural gravity that Kyoto had. Um, the worst thing you could do to an aristocrat during this period was banish them from Kyoto, send them out into the barbaric countryside, out into the provinces where there was no civilization, uh, where there were just barbarians. That was the worst thing you could do. Kyoto was the island of culture, the island of civilization in a sea of barbarity. At least that's how it was seen. And scholars have puzzled about the survival of Kyoto. I mean, how did refined, high culture Kyoto survive in this you know, sea as it was seen? And some scholars have suggested, well, uh, it's because of Kyoto's culture. It's because all the aristocrats, the would-be power seekers, were in Kyoto. They were there. Rather than being out in the countryside building power bases and spending their wealth on armies, they were in Kyoto, not building power bases, and they were spending their wealth uh, on cultural things. They were trying to outdo other aristocrats culturally. Maybe this helps explain the survival of Kyoto for several centuries as this island of culture. But political power in Japan had its limits. The mountains, the seas, the strong clan tradition, these all worked together to severely restrict the ambitions of the centralizers in Kyoto. On the surface, the imperial court expanded its control out into the provinces by placing them in the charge of its own officers. But the reality was that these outlying areas, in other words, the vast majority of modern Japan, remained mostly or completely autonomous. Indeed, most provincial posts ended up being given to the local gentry, thus preserving on the ground previous power structures while maintaining on paper a facade of centralized control. The purpose of all this, as with most any empire, of course, was expropriation. And as is so often the case, those who bore the brunt of that expropriation were the peasants. Though technically all land was supposed to belong to the emperor, in truth, the great families usually maneuvered their way into obtaining tax-exempt status for themselves, a relative luxury that they could then use to build up their own personal armies. Over time, those armies came to be not infrequently called in to restore order to the capital, and a large hereditary army was maintained in the northeast as well to hold back or suppress the Ainu, who still inhabited much of the northern half of Japan at this time. Meanwhile, the imperial family, from early on, quickly lost power to the great families around it. Now, imperial family, of course, was preserved. In Japan, that happened. But uh, one family in particular ended up sort of seizing the reins of power, or at least from behind the throne. That was the Fujiwara family, one of the great ruling families in Japanese history. And what the Fujiwara family discovered was that they could sort of stealthily usurp imperial power by intermarrying with the imperial family and this they did and they would intermarry and there would be you know a boy emperor would be produced and then that boy emperor would abdicate and all the while behind the throne serving as regent or serving as appointed dictator or just as a, a sort of master of puppets behind the scenes was the Fujiwara patriarchs uh, one one Fujiwara ruler he ruled for several decades he was the father of four emperors. He was the grandfather of two more emperors, and he was the uncle of two emperors. Actually, I think he was the grandfather of three emperors, but you get the point. The Fujiwaras figured out this game. Uh, towards the end of the period, though, even the Fujiwaras were breaking into factions. Two great Fujiwara factions called upon these provincial private armies, and when the dust settled, the Fujiwaras had lost power. The imperial family had lost power. Of course, that line continue to be preserved but it had lost power and one of the great military families had taken over and that ended the cultural effervescence of the period and instead Japan was plunged into a period of military rule and a sort of quasi feudalism if you're interested in taking a deeper dive into history consider one of my full courses 
each including something like 400 plus pages of text, 30 plus hours of audio, 50, 60, 70 on location videos filmed all over the world, plus all the scaffolding you could ask for should you want to take it like a traditional student. We're talking guided notes, both blank and filled, quizzes, structure training, document lessons. These really are unique and one of a kind. Check them out. Also, if you want to support what I do here, consider joining Nomad Nation, where you'll gain exclusive access to monthly webinars, Q&A, a monthly newsletter called Nomad Notes, special live stream events from all over the world. I'll send you four postcards a year, discounts. Go check all this out at nomadicprofessor.com.